Hi everybody, I hope you're doing marvelously well. This episode is incredibly special because we get to talk to probably one of the most talented, definitely hard-working musicians of the modern world, Mr. Jacob Collier. He is insanely talented. He's won a whole bunch of Grammys. And as a special bonus, we also get to talk to his engineer and mixer, Ben Bloomberg, who's actually more than that. Helps him put on the live shows, helps with the filming. This is an, a wonderful opportunity to talk to Jacob about music making, but also the process of how they do it, how they do the live performances, the video editing, the writing, the production, the mixing. This is a very comprehensive interview. Thank you both Jacob and Ben for this. So without further ado, let's get stuck in. And you also told me that your first show together was uh, was it opening for Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea. So that was obviously that's no pressure. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. And um, that feels like a different, different lifetime, 2015, but it, that was show number one. And um, it was, a, it was a, a, a pretty crazy one. And that was through, looking at my notes, that was that Quincy Jones got hold of you and said, how did that all come about? Yeah, well, oh, Quincy, Quincy is an extraordinary figure for me. Um, but Quincy found a YouTube video of mine that was online, uh, an arrangement of this Stevie Wonder song called Don't You Worry About a Thing, which I, I think is the one that you found, Ben. Yeah, same, and, um, same video. <laughs> same video. It's a good and one. So, <laughs> the first one I saw as well. Oh really? Oh yeah. Great. Well, well, that was that was for whatever reason. That's what that's what floated Quincy's boat, and and he he got excited and and completely freaked me out by sending me an email and saying, you know, hi, I'm Quincy, you know, <laughs> Quincy Jones, and um, and I would love to just kind of be be, be friends and, and start figuring stuff out. I'm like, what do you want to do? And so I met Quincy that summer in Montreux in 2014, and uh, there's a very a very special friend of mine and someone who works on my team. His name is Adam Adam Fell, and he's president of Quincy Jones Productions and we sat on his balcony after going to the jam session with Herbie and Quincy whoever and he said what do you want to do with your uh, with your life and I said well I'm not quite sure yet I think I need some time to figure it out but one thing I would love to do is to tour my room in some way to, to take the four walls of my my kind of my, my haven my creative space and and throw it on stage and and Adam, Adam sort of said well you know, well, well, that sounds great, but we don't know how to do that. And then out of out of the blue drops this sort of God sent email from from Ben that was just kind of at, at the perfect time, and 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 so we became firm friends. And 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 a year later, I was playing at the festival, which is just insane. When you were working together, you you are able obviously to do stuff remotely when it comes to mixing, Ben. But are you flying backwards and forwards to England? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a, there's definitely, especially especially before the pandemic, but um, but also a little bit a little bit since then. We've we've done probably two or three trips over the pandemic as well. So yeah, um, it was it was a really extraordinary. Um, I mean, obviously, 2020 was an extraordinary year for for for, for many of us in in com complex ways. But Ben was was the, the enabler of so many extraordinary creative projects at that time for me because. Not only was I making the album, uh, Jesse Volume 3, which came out in 2020, but off the back of that album, there was a lot of late night television and things that we did, and it was all completely remote. So we did Jimmy Fallon, and Ben was producing the event remotely uh, over Zoom, and we did Jimmy Kimmel, and we did Time Desk from Home, uh, and uh, we did Colbert, and we did Jules Holland, and all sorts of different things that Ben was just present. He was in the room for it. He wasn't in the room for it. So it, it was kind of an extraordinary time for, for for both of us, just in terms of learning how to do these th these things remotely, and and one of the reasons why we're so excited to kind of go on tour in a couple of weeks is that we we haven't done that for three years, and it feels like the the all of those efforts kind of come to fruition, and we can finally be in the same room and and, and all of that stuff. But but the, the the joy and the challenge of figuring out things out remotely is is profound, and you know for for Ben and I to have kind of semi identical rigs just means that when it comes to mixing and sculpting and listening and and all sorts of things. There's so much that's possible with bouncing back and forth between setups, and and you know we, we run everything through through Dropbox, and so I can close a session over here in London, and Ben can pop it open in, in Boston, and it's all it's all firing on, on on all cylinders, you know. What DAW are you working in? Well, I've been Logic since age eleven, um, well, there you and go. <laughs> so I just I'm, I'm a I'm a, a, a really a, a, a diehard Logic guy. Over the course of various collaborations in the last few years, sometimes you have to hop into Pro Tools. But we did Jesse Volume One. A lot of that was done on Pro Tools because that was orchestral recording in Holland, and, and Ben flew out there and 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 made that happen. Um, and sometimes we visit Reaper for, for certain things. Uh, we actually run 
the the, the vocal harmonizer uh, so a, a part of that runs through through reaper i think right ben yeah yeah there's a there's um, reaper in there yeah there's reaper in there so so there's there, there's sort of visitations like some of the live shows done through ableton at the parts which are loopy and things like that but all of the production and mixing we tend to do in, in, in logic i do know with logic i remember a period maybe about maybe actually when i think about it similar time if you're talking about when you were 11 you could just open it up and the virtual instruments were so good just stock. yeah yeah <laughs> i mean there were songs in the charts at that period about 15 16 years ago when you're talking that had just all stock sounds oh oh totally Totally. And I think for a kid who who is just open-eared and wants to understand how music works, a lot of it for me was opening up the logic sample folder of instruments and reading names of instruments I'd never heard of before. You know, even things like kotos and dulcimers and things, which I, I now kind of own and use and play and, and things. <laughs> but at the time it was it, a koto was just the do instrument. Yeah. And but but a hugely important one for me. And I and you know, even things like, you know, timpanis and jubilar bells and crotales and things like that. Sometimes I even prefer the the, the logic one to the real one that we that that we that is in in the studio. And sometimes Ben and I have we, you know, we've tried to record, you know, gongs and timpanis, and it's like, uh, the logic one sounds way cleaner, you know. Even if it sounds a bit fake, because it is its own instrument. So you end up playing whatever sounds are around you, you end up playing at them all as this great big instrument. And for me growing up with this room as my as my instrument, in fact, I can show you from above there, it's my room. Oh, that's um, fantastic. There's just so many little things in here that, that make sound. Um, some of them are instruments, some of them are not instruments at all. And the, the joy of the process for me is just working with, with whatever is available. And so what, what Ben has kind of completely transformed, not, not just once, but many times over in, in my life and kind of career has been giving me more kind of sounds to, to, to imagine through and, 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 and communicate through. And the harmonizer was a really global one because it was a way in which a part of my imagination, I didn't even know that existed. It was able to have, have facility and, and, and take on a sort of life of its own. Now, we were talking, Ben and I, earlier about that, that word that we all love, hate, talent, which um, can be a, a, a great word to describe somebody who's, quote unquote, talented, who has success, etc. But it it is often sort of used as a way of saying, well, I don't, I, it's not worth me working hard because I'm not talented. But Ben was right. telling me that you're a, you know, a 18 hours a day a, a person that's just, I suppose growing up with a family you did, where obviously um, when you have a grandparent that uh, w w was a, a classical musician, a parent that's a classical musician, yeah. music was around you. How much do you attribute to, to maybe growing up in that environment? And, and I suppose that and a balance of um, traditional lessons. I'm a bit of a, a, an unconventional example of this, I suppose, but um, I did grow up in a house just brimming with sounds and Incredible. in every room there was something that, that made a sound of some sort. And there was also a CD player and pressing play was a moment of mystery. You, you didn't know whether it was going to be Stravinsky <laughs> or Britain or, ben, or, or Bartok or whether it was Bobby McFerrin or Earth, Wind & Fire or Stevie Wonder that would come out. And, and so I think recognizing that you could interact with sound on many levels, but, but most of all kind of, you could say linguistic as a form, you, you think, well, it's just something I'm playing with. I'm, I'm, I'm messing about with it. I think that helped free me up. Um, I didn't really want lessons as a kid and I was, I was offered some, and I remember sort of saying to my mum, I don't, I don't know if I want piano lessons or I want bass lessons or whatever, but, but I, I just want to spend as much time as I can at those instruments. And I think that my, my kind of listening interests gradually informed um, a, a, a sort of haphazard technique, which eventually was informed by some teachers uh, who sort of in, in their specific fields, I would just be in incredibly sort of ravenous to in inhale their, their value systems and things. But, you know, someone, someone once said, and I often think about this, that, you know, education is something that is done to you by others, but learning is something that you do for yourself. Absolutely, and, and it, it doesn't matter whether you're, you know, studying in music school or whether you're just listening to the radio. You're always learning and gathering and building a sort of system of, of taste and, and belief. And I think as, as sort of sonic purveyors, you could say, I think one of the, one of the most important things is, you know, what do you like? And it's a question that's not asked very much in education. Or what do you like? But, but actually, you know, we, we spend the rest of our lives chasing that, the answer to that question. And what what sounds important? What sounds meaningful? And everyone's kind of complexion of taste is, is really different. And I think that one thing I would I would massively attribute to my mum growing up was just the ability to kind of figure out what I liked and, and follow that rather than sort of bend what I liked into what other people liked and and and, and create th through through those standards. So. You know that that kind of that process is an ever 
evolving, ever changing, uh, ever developing one. But I think that in those crucial years as a teenager, there was a lot of levity about this room. And I'm coming in here and thinking, well, I wonder what's going to happen if I just do this. And then things would come out. And, and if you have enough kind of faith in, in, in them, you, you respond and, and, and kind of and play. I love that answer. That's, it's really inspiring because I do get a lot of emails from people that say, oh, you know, I don't know if I can do music because I don't understand this mode idea and this, that and the other. And, 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 and I find that a little frustrating because I uh, obviously I'm nowhere near your level, but I grew up playing music. And just like you, I was like, oh, what is that? And then I would find out afterwards. It's almost like I, I think for many men, actually, may, maybe we can all identify with that. We tend to open up a new piece of equipment and use it maybe for about three days before we actually look at the manual. And quite often I'll look at the manual and go, oh, that's what that meant. Oh, I thought it was something else. Yeah, <laughs> right. For, for sure. I, I think I think everyone on earth has a different kind of way of interacting with that. And like, I, I think that the, the manual can be super fun and helpful to look through, as it were. But I also think that, um, you know, ripping it up at times and thinking, well, OK, so I, I could, I, I'm thinking of, of times where, where Ben and I have sat down to mix a sound and you think, well, okay, well, the way it's it's supposed to be done is X, Y, and Z. So, so maybe that's how we shouldn't do it, you know. Or maybe there's a different way of of doing it. Or, or maybe there's a sound we've heard before, but the way that we arrive at that sound is through kind of an unconventional angle, which, which gives it a particular personality that maybe you wouldn't get if you'd read the manual first. So, you know, it's it is it is such a shame that so many people go through those those systems and and end up kind of you could say quantized <laughs> their their minds have been quantized into a certain form and. And, and Ben and I have had many kind of deep conversations about this idea that uh, as kids, like what give, what is it that gives you the freedom to feel safe to just play? And, and, and how much does people who trust you, who are around you, how much does that play into it? You know, and I think both of us in our own way experienced some degree of, of people around us saying, you know what, how would you do this? Like, you know, you, you, you put your hands on this thing and, and, and you figure out a way to, to, to express something through it rather than rather than doing the thing that's always been done. And I think that, you know, for, for, for Ben in many ways, that was kind of, I mean, Ben, you can talk to this way better than me, but, you know, build, building computers and, and getting hands in all sorts of things that churn and work and, and think for themselves. And, and, and for me, a lot of that was, was sonic stuff and musical things. And, and I think that if, if there's one thing I'd wish for young people is that they feel that, that, that safety to, to mess around and play because, you know, it's not, it's not mathematics it is, it, as music is such a, such a language and there isn't really a right and a wrong chord. I mean, you can say there's a strong and, and a weak chord in a particular situation, but you, everything's, everything's on the table and, and most rules are arbitrary at the end of the day. Do you find that your instinct is, is what you rely on predominantly, or do you occasionally go back and go, well, wait there, what would be the, the way to resolve here or something like that? Or do you think it's all instinct? <laughs> well, I think that you can build, a, you can build a, a technique or a technical understanding into an intuition. And I think that once they, once they sort of fuse, that, that's when it, it becomes natural. So, you know, I, I don't sort of sit on stage and think, gosh, should, should there really be an E flat there? Because after all, it is the flat five. And or if I'm going to, you know, <laughs> I'm not thinking like that. But, I, but I, am, I am feeling my way through the E flat, having spent many hours with E flat and thinking, yeah, oh, this yeah. is, E flat can mean all these different things. And so... At a certain point, it's, it's like part of my body. It's like, well, I, I, I can use, I, I go here, but and it's not really happening in a in a left brain sense. But, but if I need to, and and sometimes it helps to to climb into that part of your brain if in say for example the, the arranging process or, or whatever, or 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 for for me with the with the mixing process sometimes too. I mean, Ben at this point is so fused with a lot of the the, the mixing world that. It, it, that Ben will will hear through the the numbers and and through the the plugins and the and the gear and, and into the result. Whereas I think sometimes for me, um, Ben has to kind of translate what those things really mean, so I get a sense of intuitively what that's going to do to the sound. But after a while, it, it all kind of joins together, and you think I'm just I'm just extending my limb through this through this technology or through this this um this harmony or through this rhythm. But it, it's really just me as a person that's that's being expressed you know nathan just uh, mentioned an mit connection yes yeah i was uh, i was at mit for 12 years um and finished in 2020 how does somebody who goes to mit actually start a career in audio engineering i've been doing audio since i was really little i got excited about it uh when i was i guess about nine when i went to mit i was actually looking for sort of the intersection of computers and audio and live performance and so uh, the Media Lab is a really 
great place um, to do sort of interdisciplinary research. So I found this research group called Opera of the Future, um, which does all kinds of sort of music technology projects, all kinds of different things, and uh, and started doing a lot of production and performance production and recording and stuff for them. So, so Ben and you have similar systems. You've built an Atmos room as well. Yeah, um, I feel like the luckiest, the, the luckiest little kid in the world. Um, to have my 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 Carly Atmos room upstairs, uh, it it sounds spectacular and it's it, it brings my family an immense amount of joy, especially when it comes to watching movies. But um, <laughs> in terms of in terms of just just being creative musically, I mean Ben Ben has had you know a decade at least of experience in this world and has really opened my ears to what's possible w- with these systems. I'm very new to that world, um, but the fact that we both now have a, a, an Atmos rig gives an extraordinary amount of I, it gives it gives energy to things I've never really considered as a creator and a lot of atmos mixing i i it seems by looking around is done after the fact it's like well i've, I've yes. made this song in yeah. stereo and let's just do an atmos mix now you know let's just put a ribbon on it and out it goes but i think one thing that ben and i are just so excited about exploring is what does it really mean to create for for that as a world yeah um, i agree where, where, I agree. where that is that's 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 your primary canvas you know i think the other thing is just thinking uh, even outside of atmos is just immersive the fact that that's obviously just one of the formats but you know i have i have a 15 year old son who's in a vr world and he's hearing sound all around him which is not how i grew up at all and it's here to stay and thinking yeah. in those terms is is pretty huge so ben uh, do you i suppose we didn't what we didn't get to talk about ben was like your own level of musicality i don't didn't ask you if you were a musician yourself sorry yeah, yeah. I mean, I um, I think that it's so important to approach the technology from that perspective. Um, and yeah, I grew I grew up sort of um, from a really young age, playing a lot of instruments and singing. And um, my grandmother was the music teacher in our elementary school, and uh, and uh, yeah, I uh, played a lot of keys and and um, school band, all of these things. Um, and then, and then did some performing in college and, and a lot of singing. So, um, yeah, I think especially as a, as a, as a live sound person, if you haven't been on stage, um, performing yourself, it's just hard to, hard to sort of connect in, in the way that I think makes, um, makes the best people do, um, you know, do what they do in the way that they do it. So now, when you're sh- sharing stuff, presumably you're you're sharing session files as well, so you can each open up each other sessions and look and see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing that's sort of quite unique about the way you know a lot of artists will bounce out stems and then it becomes a mix that nobody else can touch. And um, I think one thing that's so special is that um, you know I I can work on something and say, okay, well I've gotten you know I've gotten so far. Um, Jacob, like, like, I think, I think this needs your touch again. And, and Jacob will go in and do something and then I'll go in and do something. And it's sort of, it's sort of back and forth. Um, And I think that really allows it to be sort of the most, the most uh, sort of Jacob or Jacobian we say, you know, (laughs) but also, um, also it gives it this sort of iterative process so that the sound can, can, um, can sort of develop along, along with the music and I like that way of working. <laughs> yeah, and whenever whenever Ben jumps into a session and, and explores and, and does some stuff, when I listen back to it, there's it's like it's like a whole, a whole bunch of windows have been opened, and I can hear my way through it, it, the music in a new sense. And then there's like a whole different level or, or, or group of ideas that are uh, that are then available to me. But I think that in in the traditional sense, where as Ben said, you, you kind of say, "Well, these are my stems. Um, I, I did the take, you know, whatever it's done." Um, like that that being this iterative thing that continuously feeds itself is really educational for for me in many ways but also i think it it, it means both of us have a chance to to be stretched by the other person's process in a, in a really colorful way um and i think with with the records that i i have made and and i'm making um a lot of the the way in which we create sounds it, a lot of it's kind of kind of i i've realized it a little un- unconventional um in the sense that what creates like a you you could say like a a, a chord on on the piano or the, or the guitar in in a, in a studio session might be fifty voices and sitar and Wurlitzer and it's this combination of sounds and each like rather than making that one stem that's like 
chords or heart, whatever. Every element of that deserves a little attention and, and deserves a little sculpting. And so I think what, what Ben is just is so, so superb at doing is jumping into a sound that appears, or you could say it's perceived as one sound, but then picking apart that sound and finding its components and making the components be spatialized or make sense in terms of frequency or, or whatever. And, and then when you, when you recompile everything, you can hear in that much more kind of resolution, I suppose. It's like hearing in, 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 in 4K versus HD. It's like, oh, even I didn't know that was in the session and I, re I recorded it. You know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting process. When you're writing, are you writing in a live performance way? Most records are made by solo artists. It's like, you know, acoustic guitar part goes down or whatever the main instrument, piano, etc. And then we put a drum beat down or maybe there's a drum beat and then you put something else on top and you sort of build it up in a layer. I, th I think I've got this sort of, visually I've got this idea of you creating in a live way while writing because it's part of the production process because you know, when I've got the, the advantage of having a live band in a room, I can work on individuals, and but uh, they've all got their own brains. They're all like mini producers. You've got a world-class bass player playing with a world-class drummer, etc. So you've got like these little miniature producers. So I wonder, I mean, how is your writing process slash recording process? Yeah, well, I think I think in some ways composition is sort of like improvisation, but it's in stop time rather than real time. Um, I think as I improve at, as a producer, or at least evolve, um, that there, there is, there's a certain amount of um, speeding up that that process kind of does. Rather than a 15, 16, 17 year old kind of Jacob in, in his room uh, doing uh, you know, a, a piano part and then thinking, okay, now let me make that sound good. Let's do a drum part, let's do whatever. I think now I, I think about it as one gesture. You sort of think I, I will, Three, three or four things may occur to me at once. You think, okay, I've got the bass and drums, and then it just sort of happens in in one go, and and the, the the technology kind of ceases to to exist as a barrier, at least when it's done right, because then I can just kind of be be a person through the through the tech. And it's something that Ben and I have spoken about a lot in terms of the, the live show, which greatly inspired my recording process with the the, the one the one man show that we built before, because it was this process where within 30 seconds, you'd have five or six tracks recorded and playing. Um, and I, I don't think that my process was ever really the same after that, because I realized it was possible to ideate it on, uh, at that speed and, and things. And, and I think a lot of my best ideas happen quickly, um, which is something I've, I've learned about myself. If I sit and agonize over a lyric or a, or a section or whatever for a long time, it, it slowly <laughs> dies. And so a lot of the challenge, I think, for for you know, using like you know, getting comfortable with a, with your gear and your setup is is getting to the point where you feel it's not there. I'm just I'm just going. It, it's it's happening on its own, and I'm just kind of attending the session as as an observer and watching all these ingredients happen. And I, it's not having to sit down and think, okay, so how do I do that, or how do I how do I record this in, or whatever. And but sometimes those questions can lead to very interesting answers as well. Are you working on multiple songs at once? So you're sending some stuff to Ben while also, you know, creating something new and Ben's yeah, smiling. Hundreds, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ben's smiling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lo lots of um, lots of lots of different layers. Yeah, but Ben Ben knows more, more than anyone about just these these deep folders of many, many, many different things. Um and I think it helps because everything you make will always be in everything you make in the future in some way. And so I think what I've realized now in making this album I'm currently working on, you know, it's it's like I've got, yeah, 160 demos or whatever. And some of them are songs and some of them are just seeds and some of them are loops and ideas. But the, the DNA of, of all of them will will be in whatever the album ends up being, they'll be present in it because I because I've made it. So I think I think part of the freedom of letting yourself create, you know, as you need to is 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 sometimes letting the weird ideas come out and thinking it's okay if this isn't necessarily like the verse of my song, but every experiment you learn from. And so sometimes, you know, Ben and I will work on a song and I'll go and work on something else. And then I'll, I'll return to that song afterwards and be like, oh, you know what? This, you know, the song is, is its own thing, but this one sound we can bring in and, and use in, in this song. And so every time Ben introduces me to a plugin or a, or, or, or a, a, piece, a piece of gear or even a musical instrument comes into my life, it's, it's, it's a new way to think through. And so, you know, in some ways it's it's hundred different songs at once, but in other ways it's it's all the same song. You know, it's just it's it's one song with many arms that is the song of <laughs> of my life that just kind of keeps on evolving and, and keeps on teaching me stuff. Ben, are you going back to Jacob and 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 nudging him, going, "Hey, you sent me this idea. You know, 
March of last year, and I love it, and it needs to be explored more. Is that that kind of relationship? I think the most excited I get when we work together is is hearing new new ideas and and new things, and um, and I did I think we did I think we did sort of realize that sometimes having time like actually makes a really big difference. You know, having having a chance to just sit on things and then come back to it. You know even six months later. Um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, it, it's pretty organic, um, but, but um, we definitely have a healthy back and forth. And there are definitely, there are definitely ideas that I get really excited about. Um, I sort of have my, uh, I don't know, the things that make me excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a wonderful feeling to, to show Ben something because the way he listens is, is so kind of unique and also comes from such a place of, of, of understanding what we've already built together, uh, and so that that can be really special. And I'll, I'll never forget that that middle of twenty twenty time where we were finishing that that album, Ben. And it was just, you know, they, they get to a point where it's like, okay, this is the album. Now we just finish the album. And so it's you know, sort of two or three weeks of just really intense kind of these eighteen hour days. And we'd be trading back and forth at the speed of light. We'd be like, okay, you work on the chorus of this, while I work on this, and then I'll switch. And when you do that, work on that one, and whatever. And and it's it's such a special process, and I think in in a, in a traditional sense, you know, you'd all be in the studio and you'd be working on the album together and stuff. But that at this point in the in the world of music, it's it's fully possible remotely, and and in a certain way, I think that us being apart at that time gave us a, a, a clarity over our our own process. That when you're both at the same computer, it it doesn't work like that, you know. And we were we were both able to go really deep on designing these things and and get it across the line. And the time zone's probably quite quite exciting because you can get up in the morning and there's bing something new has arrived and <laughs> yeah, and... <laughs> yeah. It, it, the fun the funny thing is that i i end up so ben's five hours behind me technically but i end up going to sleep later than ben sometimes because i'm such a <laughs> such a night up. so it would be like ben waking up in the morning to, to the thing i just finished at 8 a.m you know, <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> or sometimes i wake up and he's well, I'm, I'm still, still going. You're still up, yeah. <laughs> right. you're still I mean, you're, yeah. you're you're working so hard and so uh, fluently. Uh, do you do you think you're ever going to move out of that house? Or you, you do you think you're just going to kind of yeah. take it over, buy the it's, family it's so out? Hard I'm going to keep this it. room. It's it's the hardest room to leave in the world, as you can probably imagine. It's just there's always something new to be explored here. Um, I'm sh I'm sure it will always be in my life in a fundamental way. Um, I'm also sure that there'll be many incarnations of the spirit of this room in different parts of the world, different different er sort of eras of my life. Um, we're even going to try and build a very miniature version on the the, the, the tour bus in, in a couple of months' time that that will go around with us because it's good to be able to work on things. But you know, th this is the room I learned to walk, and so you can't really build that anywhere else. And so, you know, I I, I sort of get the sense that. You have to get in, into the, the, the deepest part of being in a room. It's just it's understanding what that what that particular room has to offer. And you know, I've spent so many tens of thousands of hours in, in here making music. And in a certain way, leaving this room and going somewhere new can be very important because it it gives you a, a very different clarity in things. But but sometimes, if 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 you really want to know how something feels, you 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 bring it back here and you you play it for the room and 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 see what what the room guides you to do next. Now, with the live stuff, are uh, some of the improvisations that happen on stage that have they've turned into album tracks? Yeah, it's so funny because Soundcheck is, is a uniquely special time. I mean, obviously the show is as well, but in Soundcheck, especially now with the band, you've got this little window of time where people are just getting comfortable, and out will come a little riff, a little noodle, and or I'll be, I, I will have just learned the like the other day I learned the Ukrainian national anthem, and I was I've been playing it a lot because it's such a beautiful anthem. And and so it feeds into all the other things that I'm doing. And, and one of the magical things about touring is that I'll be playing something I've just learned and Rob will have just heard this record and we might have a little jam that that becomes a thing and, and someone might whip out a phone and voice memo it and, and, and that sort of go, goes into a, a folder um, of, of things. But I think the important thing is as a musician is wherever you end up, at least what I find is that wherever you end up, you have to always, you have to, you have to be, be ready for the idea to walk in and take you by surprise and you have to have your ears wide open for very unexpected sources of of inspiration because i think in the right mind space everything in the whole world is, is an idea you know everything's an idea even stuff you really hate or disagree with or or whatever. it's like ah oh, okay if, if you if you learn how to kind of alchemize the the, the friction of hmm oh whoa you know then everything becomes a, a a stimulus for moving forward that's what friction is it's like movement so 
So, you know, there are definitely times where I'm just really exhausted and, and no ideas are coming out and I have those days often. But I think that in my most natural space, it's this constant sponging in of of things. And, and on stage is, is one of those special moments where you're very reactive and very present and, and always on, on the lookout for something to stroll into your your creative sphere and take you by surprise. Well, first of all, do you record your live performances and then do you go back and listen to them and get inspired and pick out melodies? And Yeah, we, we've, done, we've done a bit of that in the past. The thing about the one-man show was that because it was done on click track for a lot of the show, the structures wouldn't change, right? Um, which actually would, would sometimes mean that the ideas... Uh, what what Ben and I found was was some of the, yeah some of the some some of the ideas that would come out of the structure would be, it like they'd be wanting to be free from the structure so they'd be pushing against it and that friction again was sometimes really exciting especially once we got comfortable with the show, but then there's always a moment in the show or a few moments where something happens that you can't plan, and and for me my one of my favorite <coughs> moments of the show right now, is uh, is at the end of the show I, I tend to stand with my audience and sing, or I, I you could say sing through them I'll I'll, I'll I'll hum a couple of notes out and then the room is singing sometimes in three or four part harmony and by using my sort of arrows up and down with with my fingers I I guide them through different chords and things and that really is utterly different every single show and so Incredible. there are there are, there are definitely times you think well what was it about Atlanta you know or what, what something happened in in like in Wellington New Zealand you know there was it was just something happened I remember actually in in Melbourne once we had the audience I, I think I did this like that and then I shook my hands and the audience just erupted into this chorus of, of of bird song, but it wasn't just any old bird song. It was like Melbourne savvy bird song, like really high level <laughs> kind of like Australian bird. And I, some of these calls I had never heard, you know, you know, crazy, crazy things. And it was just a, a one off thing that I, I it never happened again. You know, it, it probably will, will never happen again. But um, you know, I, I I think those moments are, are so important to remember. Did you record and, it? And to let go. I don't know if we recorded that gig actually, but. Luckily, there were people in the audience who were filming moments, so I have some of videos course. on my phone of, yeah. of, of fan of fan fan moments. But there's a certain part of the live show that you have to just say, "Well, that's that." You know, that happened then, and you can listen back to the desk mix, but it doesn't feel like like it felt at, at the moment at that at that time. You know. Now we we met through obviously our mutual friend uh, Nathan over at Cali, and yes. I think one of the things that's exciting is the gear that you use. If you either you're either designing it yourself or it's modest. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny, we really started out, I mean, he started out with, you know, an SM58, single, single mic, you know, consumer, you know, focus right audio interface. And when it comes to the speakers, it's sort of like, we were still, you know, somewhat a mom and pop, situ, you know, sort of, sort of operation. And, and um, we, you know, we, we, a lot of people are really nice to us and we'll, we'll, we'll um, you know, send us things. But when it actually comes to you know, purchasing gear and and thinking about you know where we where we put our resources, we, we have to be really, um, really sort of uh, uh, careful about you know where 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 does the value go and and uh, you know when we were in the middle of the pandemic, we were working on with the two of us were sort of working on volume three back and forth across the uh, at Jacob in London, me here in in Boston and. Um, and I was looking, yeah, I was looking for a set of speakers just to give me something slightly different than I had at the, at, you know, at, at the time. And, um, and I saw the collies and thought, oh man, you know, that for, I, you know, there's, there's no reason not to give these a try basically. And, um, and then they sort of ended up becoming, you know, you know, pretty, pretty crucial to my whole process with that, with that record. Um, and then, you know, following that, uh, we started thinking about Atmos stuff and, um, and also, you know, upgrades and changes for Jacob's music room. And, and so, uh, yeah, the, the speakers have sort of remained a, uh, sort of a key player in, in, in a lot of the things that we're doing and thinking about, uh, it's just unbelievable value for, for what, you know, for what you. Yeah. It's very important to me. Um, you know, Actually, currently, I don't have a pair of LP6s in the middle, but typically I, I, I have inexpensive speakers up there and it's, typically always the LP6s. I feel like it's, from my perspective, I feel like it's really important to show people that, you know, they can make music on a budget. And more importantly, you guys actually are doing that. <laughs> yeah. You're winning Grammys on that. You know, I don't want to be completely disingenuous and, and, you know, say, you know, like we've, you know, 
you know, we've recorded at Abbey Road and we've been, you know, we've been all these places, but then he gets home and, and, and yeah, it's just sort of the two of us and whatever gear we have in our respective, you know, for me is just, this is literally just my living room. Um, although I'm lucky to have, you know, to have those on the ceiling now, but, um, uh, but I think, uh, yeah, yeah, it, 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 I think it is important to help people understand that gear isn't the be all end all and, and, uh, and it, it opens up, it opens up the, you know, that world to, to more people too, which is awesome. I, I, I feel like we can't have a conversation about your music without actually talking about video because it really started with video. So there you are, you, you know, 2011 creating that, you know, multi faceted, um, thing which nobody else was really doing and not to the level you were doing was that a technical challenge for you at the time or was it just some software you suddenly discovered and went oh this is cool uh yeah well both i would say it was a, a huge <laughs> a huge challenge but i didn't notice the challenge because i was too it, i was too busy trying to get my idea to to work you know right i didn't have a clue how to edit videos like i still don't really have a clue <laughs> but i remember i remember at, the, at that time my school had a software called final cut express which is a little, it was a little janky back in 2011. It was like not very easy to use. And, but, but I knew that you could do multiple faces on it. And I remember going up to one of my teachers, Mr. G and saying like, Hey man, like this is so great. You have this software. Like, oh, I'd really like to just take it home and mess around <laughs> with it. I've got some ideas. And he said, well, like, I'm really sorry, but you know, sc school policy goes, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't give this, this software to anyone outside of the school. You know, the school, it has to stay on school grounds. I said, oh, you know, okay, fine. And I looked up on it, it's like 300 pounds. And I thought that's my thought, there's no way I can afford this. So I was, I went back to, to speak to Mr. G about something else a couple of weeks later. And, and as he left the room, he just, he said, oh man, I just want to say again, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't help you out with that. I, I couldn't hook you up with that software, but you know, good, good luck with your experiments. And he just dropped this little CD on the, on the desk as he left the room, which is unlabeled. And um, and I took it home and in, and installed Final Cut Express and and that started my <laughs> career, uh, you, you could say. So so it was really a serendipitous moment of Mr. G enabling me to have the tools and then watching some YouTube videos and getting the basics down and just sort of doggedly pushing and pushing and pushing until I'd achieved like the absolute the absolute idea and and you know making sure all the boxes were kind of symmetrically laid out and that the colors worked and that there was high contrast in certain moments and. And I, actually, getting getting to know those details, it, it, that language is it's really kind of similar in some ways to music because it's a lot of the, the visual components exist in, in music. Like you say, contrast or space or color, density. Um, you could say like or, or organization of, of ideas. Uh, all, all those things happen sonically every day in my head. So it was almost like joining the dots between one thing, one language I spoke and one language I didn't know I already spoke. But there's there's always that moment where you have no skills and you have to just find some skills and and I I, I got just enough skills <laughs> to be able to piece together these videos and press upload and and uh, you know I'm so grateful to to Mr G for that moment but but also for Final Cut Express for 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 working so so kind of well it was pretty slow but it worked really really beautifully <laughs> at that time for me and and enabled me to dream and it, in the same way that you could say like the harmonizer. Did a few years later, it was it was a, 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 it gave me permission to have a limb through which I could dream and express, and and that's all you really need as a as a human, and and that's why collaboration, you know, that's why Ben, ben and my collaboration is is so unique because I think both of us feel the other person is like an extension to their own arm in a different way, and that's really really special. Uh, kind of a funny story, I. I found one of his YouTube videos um, really early on in 2014 and just sent him a Facebook message um, saying, hey, I really like what you're doing. I like to build things. If you ever want to build anything, let me know. And uh, two weeks later, I got a reply. And uh, I guess the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> Did you build something together? Did you actually build something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we. So first we built... Um, uh, his harmonizer, which is this instrument that he plays, we built it um, in order to allow him to perform. Uh, until then, he had only really made YouTube videos in his room and hadn't really performed live before. So we um, we worked together to think about what it would take to basically allow him to create those YouTube videos live in front of an audience. And so part of that was the harmonizer, which lets him lay down sort of these vocal stacks really quickly. And then we designed this whole looping show, which was six different loopers and you know 
like 50 open microphones and and all these all this crazy sort of looping stuff both video and then also audio we did we did uh, some some uh video looping as well the tiny desk um visuals were absolutely incredible the four camera shoot at the same time <laughs> i yeah oh thanks <laughs> how was was that of your making uh, it was that was um, that was one of my favorite 2020 weeks uh i think i used was it this camera yeah that's the camera <laughs> I've got all these different cameras that Ben helped me yep. install, and <laughs> and this camera here, it was pointed in the in the other, other direction towards me. You yep. can see my hand there. I'm sorry. Yep. Um, <laughs> and and we, we we turned it around, and and yeah, Ben Ben really, obviously completely remotely, he really helped me kind of get that framing right, um, and Incredible. helped me kind of engineer it too, and like the room mics which are on top of the door over there, they they were really important for for, for the mix of that because everything close might it's very easy for it to just sound like a like a studio, but we wanted it to feel like a room. And so, you know, I, I did five days of planning it in, in my head, kind of pacing the garden and thinking, okay, I'll do this and this and this. The hardest part to nail was actually the, the dialogue. It was it was like, hey, I'm Jacob. No, that's my name's Jacob. You know, that thing was really, really hard <laughs> because, you know, it, it's, it's, it's easy to be like, hi, but that's not real. You know, you, mm -hmm. you have to kind of interact with the person and the, and the humor and all those intangible things that that's what, that's what really got me excited about the challenge. It's like, how do I make this not feel like four copies of me in boxes? You know, because I've done a lot of that. But the 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 spirit of it that I was going after was this, the feeling that it was actually four four different well four different incarnations of of the same mind um, in a way that felt natural and simultaneously. Like, yeah, simultaneously, and and obviously it's it's they're all complete takes as well. So one wrong note and you're just screwed. You know, after thirteen <laughs> minutes of na nailing it, oh, I got the wrong note. But um, I, I think part of it, part of the charm of it, was that it was a little, like, kind of scrappy around the edges. But but it was it was kind of real and 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 uh, yeah, me, me and Ben had a we had a, a real field day, kind of getting it to feel good sonically because, you know, you've got all these different all these different channels and a lot of them are kind of duplicate channels. Like the room mics are you've got whatever twelve room mics channels or 10, 10 room mic channels, and and you've got you have to have make make them all feel like they're all part of the same world but we cranked those room mics super loud right yeah. ben, what was it like 20 db i think it was 40 db we ended up turning them <laughs> wow <on. laughs> because you you hear the room you know yeah like, yeah. yeah it's really funny yeah that's incredible <laughs> you've done look you've there's so many sort of standout things i've got all my notes here and i'm sitting oh, here wow. looking going oh, <laughs> yeah there's a hundred questions going to ask you um i'll spare you from the hundred but of things that are exciting for me, I mean, like 2018 performed at the proms. I mean, mm, that was mm. like a religion in my household. Well, um, mine too. Yeah. Did your Did your parents? Well, I'm, I'm older than you, obviously, so you, you probably uh, uh, back in the day when I was a kid, TVs had horrible sound systems. So my dad would tune into Radio Three, put the speakers either side of the television, and just crank okay. it. Oh God! Wow, that's, <laughs> that's great. That's, great. <laughs> that's so nice. It was now. Yeah, it, it, that was a that was a journey. I mean, uh, ben, ben was Ben was in the house for that one, and that was one of those days that you'll never forget. I mean, it was so oh. many things. They they hung a PA right, Ben. Do, do you want to you tell that story? Yeah, they hung the PA like um, six new PA. six meters too high. And that was just <laughs> that was just what we had, and it was yeah, it was eight mixing desks. It, it was un, unbelievable, sort of infrastructure and, and complexity um, so that the sound was going up six meters above everybody's head over oh just shooting <laughs> over everybody's shooting over, head that, yeah that room is 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 such a special room for acoustic music and it's pretty challenging sometimes for electronic sounds and for and for things and and we had some some electronic sounds in that in that gig were were just interesting even drums actually is quite interesting to make it sound good but the specialness of that day is kind of unparalleled in my in my life and actually my, my grandfather Derek Collier he played, I think it was the last night of the promise in 1964. And there's actually footage of him playing um, that they, I think they unearthed on that, on the day of that prom and they showed me. It was really, really moving. But um, yeah, to be there, whatever it was, 50 years or 54 years later. And and it, it was like a family affair. My, my mom was playing in the orchestra and and it was a really crazy, crazy night. Yeah, I, I sort of cherry picked that. Being English, I just thought, mm. I was trying to think, wonder what one of the highlights might be. And I, 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 I'm i glad that it, it was for you. That's incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, with uh, volume four, is there a volume four? Are you making it at the moment? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's absolutely a volume four. Um, yeah, it's it's very much a work in progress. And um, 
I think our plan is to is to get through this tour, which we just so kind of desperately need. We need that, that energy to come in, in order to kind of clarify things. But we're we're overflowing with ideas, and and I've got so many things, and um, I'm I'm super 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 excited, kind of more excited than I can possibly say to start to see those into the world. Um, and I think yeah, we're 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 taking our time and and getting it exactly right. And uh, I'm hoping that sometime next year it will be sort of exploding in, into the world and. Um, and it will be a, a, a take on a whole whole life of its own, you know. How long is the tour going for? About seventeen years. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, the, the tour. Th this tour is um, for five months or so. We got April, May, yeah. June, July. July. I guess we're, but we're four, so four months, kind of four months straight, and then we've got Australia and Asia in at the end of the year. I think that that's yet to be announced, but it's it's soon to come. Um, and then 2023, 2024, we've got, we've got all sorts of crazy plans there, which I, I can't dare talk about yet. But um, yeah, there are some, <laughs> some, some really exciting kind of things on the, on the horizon. But I think it's funny now, after the, after the, the weirdness of the last few years, I think that just, just being kind of, you know, being healthy and, and feeling like it's, 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 it's cool to have a, a workspace that, that can be in, international and being able to do shows and, the, the, the very simple nature of having a career in music just feels like such a huge privilege and honor, you know, that we get to design sounds and and share them with people, and that you know that and that, that we, we we're here still and, and we're, we're still we're taking along. That that feels like the ultimate kind of victory at the end of the day. And and so albums and tours and songs and all these things kind of feel like a a, a, a bonus, you could say, to a process that is is so colorful and and um, continues to teach us so much. Absolutely, and and you are, you know, an incredible example of of of, an, of a modern industry that defies any stereotypes from the past. Oh, oh, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a very very exciting time to be creating music. I, I don't. There's probably never been a more exciting time ever in, in history to be agree to be dreaming dreaming up sonic things than than right now. You you are. The, ex the finest example of, for me, for substance over style, you know, it, music industry that I grew up in was, you know, lots of really, you know, colourful 80s videos with great haircuts. And, <laughs> oh, and, <laughs> I love it. And, and it's so beautiful that, that all age groups are connecting with you, um, you know, out for the music. For oh. the music. And it's incredible. I do want to ask a nerdy question. Did you, the, the negative harmony, did you, um, did you, did you kind of come up with that and then go back and read about Ernst Levy, or was it the other way around? How did that happen? That oh, that that concept was that kind of transformed my brain for a few years when I was in, in college. But um, the the term negative harmony was coined by a very very important kind of musical educator figure, a saxophonist called Steve Coleman. Oh, okay. Um, and Steve is an American guy, and he came up with this idea of, of of negative harmony. And he actually he used it as a very melodic concept. The idea was you have a melody that goes up, and you can have a version of the, the same melody that goes down that has the same kind of gravity. But I was really excited about exploring this with with, with chords because that was my ultimate crush. And I had a very, very special and important teacher at that time. His name is Barak Shmuel. He's like a, 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 he was my world rhythms teacher. And and I used to sort of steal him at lunchtime and be like, Barak, tell me about this crazy concept, you know. And he, <laughs> he knows about so many things. And one of those things was was negative harmony because he, he'd study for all with Steve Coleman. So he really kind of lit my mind up. And I, I kind of took it and, and ran with it. And, it was just the the, fun, the the funniest thing where I mentioned it in passing in this interview with a, a fan of mine, and it, the whole thing kind of blew up, which is really unexpected. And and that Ernst Levy book kind of saw a, a resurgence in, in sales and things. But it was really <laughs> amazing. But but Barak recommended that book to me because it's something that he read. Ernst was a, a classical composer, and um, he he really kind of used that concept in in such a deep mathematical almost like philosophically sound way, like about kind of balance and symmetry and things. And, and for me, I was interested because it gave me new chords. And it was like, well, I've got some new chords and, and also a, a, a new psychology of thinking about motion. You know, all motion has an inverse motion that, that kind of affirms the, the existing motion. And it's an idea that I thought about in, in numerous ways outside of music in terms of like in, intention and, and um, energy and things like that. But applying it to harmony was like, it just felt like the most cool thing ever. And, and it was it was quite quite a delight when that 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 concept kind of lit up a, a, a few people back in whatever it was twenty seventeen and and uh, it's 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 very um it's very nice when when a concept could be explained so eloquently that it just kind of lands in, in your pocket and that was one of them for me. I, one of the things I will enjoy being uh, English slash British is 
there's still that sense of irreverent humor in what you do. I mean, you go right back oh. to the early videos and you, you're like, your hair's like this on one part, your hair's <laughs> like that on another, you've got a different shirt on. It's got a, you know, a, a healthy level of python mixed in there, which oh, I've always I'm enjoyed. So, it's so wonderful to hear you say that. I, it, that, that reference is very important to me. Um, uh, I, I think there, there is a, a Britishness about about the way that I've consumed music kind of, and media, you could say, for, for my whole life, which doesn't does it wouldn't surprise you since I'm British, but I'm I'm really glad that you say that because I think that that kind of irreverence is is super important and it's important on stage and and it's important in the studio and 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 all sorts of things. But I think one of the th one of the biggest shames is is when you start taking yourself too seriously. You know, it's like this is really serious. I'm a musician and it's very important that I. You know, it's like you know, it's we're having fun. <laughs> it's it's okay, and uh, and I think it's it's uh, it, it's nice to create with a little sprinkle of. Of Python, you know. One geeky thing, because I'm sure maybe you've been asked this before. What what software and cameras and stuff do you use? Is there a particular? Have you had a camera for years, or are you always continually uh, uh, changing stuff up? Change you you mean with regards to like filming videos and things? With filming videos, etc. Yeah, you're you know, of a... you know what's so funny is like this guy is just so important now. Wow. In a way that it, it never used to be. I mean, the last few videos um, that I edited myself have have all been shot. I've done hundreds of videos on 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 this and you know filming it with the wide angle lens or whatever and putting it into premiere and 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 going um so that that is that's kind of like my, my unfortunately it's kind of my number one but i in this in this music room i've got a whole bunch of of fuji fuji film cameras xe3 i'm looking at you through an xe3 uh -huh. right now <laughs> there's great. another one over over the piano um and in over the last few years i've there's there's a there's some lumixes that we toured with for a bit i think there's a lumix over there next to the piano and there's I'm using also, a Lumix as we speak, yes. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Mouse, phone, heart. And, and also Canon was pretty important for me when I was like sort of 18, 19, and those early videos was done a lot, a lot on a Canon. But 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 Ben Ben is is, is mastermind of, of many things, and cameras is one of them. And so ah, ben, ben. Ben's been really, really supportive and, and helpful in selecting the right, just the right cameras for this particular setup in here, because every one of these shots kind of has a different set of requirements and and and, and things. So so yeah, I mean, as always, it's it's Ben who who helps to coordinate so many of the, of, of of those things. I feel like a Star Trek analogy it, it, it should should be inserted here. I feel I, I remember when cell phones started becoming you know the cell phones that we're used to now, like basically mobile computers, mo mobile mainframes almost uh, or more. Anything you could imagine can be done now. But I suppose the question is: Is there anything that both of you still yearn for is there some technology that you think would be just great if you could do this thing i mean you must have technical discussions all the time well obviously you know uh, well, we do I, I, ben what would you say to that oh man that's a tough one i mean I, <laughs> <laughs> no i mean I, it's great i think it's interesting a lot of the biggest challenges i sort of feel like are still at the intersection of people and machines and so um having having things like you know like jacob said that that really don't impede the creative process um but also sort of act like a bionic limb you know we want the the music room to sort of feel like an iron man suit or something you know where you're it's an extension of everything you do um uh there's still a lot of work to be done there i think um and you know people are throwing around sort of machine learning and ai as sort of this you know, mega be all end all solution. And it's actually kind of complicated and it does some things pretty well, but a lot of things it doesn't do that well. And uh, uh, so I think there's, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's definitely room for desire there and, and room for a lot of things we, a lot of things we want to create. And also we, we sort of run into physical limitations when, it, especially when it comes to touring and, you know, it's like, well, we really want this keyboard. Or we really, really, really want this thing in this package, but actually, it's not quite that small yet. Or like, it needs right, to, right. you know, um, yeah. you know, it it it's this funny thing. I, I I think we we end up in a lot of sort of like edges and little corners, and and end up having a lot of wishes. So, a lot of what this we is, do is trying to figure out how to get somewhere good. You know, just posing with the things one that we last have. question. Then, yeah, uh, yeah. If you don't mind me asking, one last question. Yeah. So here you are. You you're both. You know. You're young. You've grown up with all of the greatest technology ever, ever invented. We got unlimited amount of traps. <laughs> but here you are, 
Jacob's surrounded by real instruments. And yet, you know, we're sold on this idea that you just need an iPhone, an iPad, a laptop or whatever, and everything is at your fingers. That just just hand me over a MIDI keyboard with some pads on it and that's it. That's all I need. Just the rest of it's software. So I have to ask the question, it, it, do you feel there's a romanticism and that's why you like it? Or do you think this is still the best way to go? Personally, I think everyone everyone has a different set of, of mm -hmm. materials that move, that moves them. And I just love musical instruments and it's how I learned music. And I think that I find, I find it so kind of calming the way that they're so like resolutely holding their form. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm a piano, I'm not changing. I, I'm going to be a piano tomorrow. And I was a piano <laughs> yesterday. And I, th I think what, one thing I'm finding now with, with, the, with the technology being so equipped to help is that you, you, you can get really smothered by it, in infinity. And, and I really, really love and require increasingly actually things in in my life that aren't infinite and, uh, and don't give me every option in the world and so in, in a certain way you know I look back at, at that those final cut express days or filming on my sister's iPad or whatever and I think oh you know there was a there it was so frustrating it was so slow I had to wait seven hours to render a two uh, two two minute clip or whatever but 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 then actually those seven hours meant I had to think about my idea and, and it evolved and and sometimes things that slow you down can be so crucial in, in, the, in the process. So for me, a musical instrument is one thing. And it, it obviously behind every boundary is another infinity. But I think that the infinity within a musical instrument is for me more helpful than the infinity sometimes, than the infinity within say software, where it's like you can play every instrument, every chord, every sound can be made at your, at your fingertips. And so sometimes I think what I like to do is to start with instruments to feed things in from those kinds of limitations. And then once you're in the, the system, you, you're held together by the form of the thing you've made, and then you go to infinity from there. Um, and I think it's the, the trick is how do you get in? It's like, how do you get into your idea in a way that feels kind of like safe and, and a way that feels like you're gonna be challenged by it? And I don't know, there's something about the, the wood of the musical instrument, the strings that, if I clap in this room, I don't know oh, if you wow. can hear that, but yeah, every, I can every, hear it. Yeah, yeah. every guitar hear goes, mm, yeah. yeah. And, and so it's constantly speaking to me, this room, and, and, and giving me ideas in a way that like a laptop just goes, you know, until you, until you feed it something. So uh, for, for me, I, maybe it is a little bit of a romanticism, but I, I'm always going to be on the side of, of acoustic sounds. And then, you know, as long as I've got, got Ben on my side, those acoustic sounds can go in infinite directions in their own right, but they started their life in, in physical air, which I really like. And I, I presume the randomness, the sort of, which you don't really get with an on-off kind of world of like yeah. going down, on, off, on, off, suddenly you're like hitting something and, and like you just expressed there, you, you've you got the resonant frequencies of all the strings. It's new, it's new every time, yeah, new every time. And I mean, my favorite instrument of all time is and probably always will be the human voice, just because, first of all, we all have one and ev every single one is totally unique, which I think is really not you kind of discussed enough. It's like that's extraordinary, um, but but also you know it's such an extension of your of your humanity. And if I sing one note again and again for the rest of my life, every time is going to be different. Whereas if I play, you know, there's kind of 127 options, and then it's like I go home. You know, so <laughs> so yeah, as you say, there is the the, the the sort of chaotic nature of it, which can be really really giving in, in a in, in a nice way. Incredible. Thank you ever so much, both of you. It's been absolutely a wonderful time like i said i could talk to you for many many more hours but i'm sure you've got plenty of things to do and i've, I've watched your uh, background go from blue sky to now darkness so, oh, oh mine yes yeah yeah no the, the, the sun is the, the sun has gone down yeah no, it's true <laughs> it's very true yeah um well thank you so much for, for hanging out um with, with with us both and and um thank you for just for enabling such such sonic experiments as, as the ones that you have and we're so so grateful to you for for just being on our side through through these experiments and and it, it wouldn't be possible without you so thank you so so much you you have a, an incredible audience and and the fact that you're you're speaking to such an enormous age group i i i i, I thank you both for that because you know it's, it's it's a big deal you know where music has become sterile in some ways it's also become very experimental and new and refreshing which i think has actually been forever you know, I think at the moment there's a lot of sort of wagging fingers talking about the music industry, and I, 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 I I'm smothered with that from people. But you bring in something that um, 
takes dissipates all of that, takes all that other way. It just is, is the anti, oh my God, I sound old American, the anti version of that. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, gu- I'm guilty of the occasional anti as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you saying that. And, um, you know, we're all, we're all just figuring it out as we go along. And, uh, and, sure. and I'm, I'm glad we're all, we're all on this planet at the same time. And, and it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's a journey. It really is a journey. Thank you, you rock. Thank you. You rock as well. <laughs> <laughs> we will, we'll see you uh, see, see you very soon. See you soon. Oh, by the way, Songs of the Key of Life on the console at all times. Oh, at all times. At all times. <laughs> at all times. It doesn't get any better. F- fantastic choice. Fantastic choice. <laughs> Good man. I hope you enjoyed that. That, for me, was really a wonderful, wonderful experience. What a genuinely couple of great guys who have the passion and probably most importantly, the work ethic to create Incredible music that really helps unite people over all genres. Jacob's audience is like 8 to 80 and everybody in between. It's an incredible thing that he's able to create music like this that so many people can identify with. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Ben. And please stay tuned. Oh, and leave any comments and questions below. And uh, thank you ever so much for watching. So long, farewell, au revoir, adios, hey ciao. Goodbye.